Father, we stand before you at this moment of time and in this place and space in the realization that we were not brought here by accident, nor by chance, nor by luck, nor by fate, nor by the maneuvering of our circumstances, but we were brought here by divine appointment. divine appointment made before the foundation of the world. And perhaps for some of us, this very moment of time is the sole reason for which we were formed in our mother's womb. And when we were separated from our mother's womb and brought into this life, the boundaries that you set upon our habitation were the forces and to gently draw us at the same time to this particular moment where we might stand face to face with the truth of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. And so this is a precious and important moment. It could very well be the last moment some of us will ever experience in this life before we see this living truth face to face. For some of us, it could be the high noon of our spiritual experience. It could be the crossroads of eternity. It could be that hour of decision where we make that final choice that will last for all the ages to come. So we cannot look upon this moment lightly. And when we think of the eternal consequences involved in this moment, and the eternal and heavenly spectators, angels are watching, they're present here listening, hoping to learn in the assembly this morning from the Holy Spirit mysteries which have been hidden since before the foundation of the world. And as we realize that not only are angels present and listening, watching and listening attentively, but we realize also that those who have gone on before us, who are now in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at your throne, they also are heavenly spectators. Yes, we are, Father, surrounded this morning with such a great cloud of witnesses. We sense their presence. And we know that Jesus is here. And we know that the Holy Spirit is here. And we know that because the Blessed Son and the Holy Spirit are here, you are here too. And you've visited your temple, not a building now, but a temple not made with hands, an earthly tabernacle. The bodies of these poor saints who sit here in this hall house the eternal God. And Father, we are awed by thy presence. And we pray now that as a father would gather his children unto himself and comfort them and teach them and counsel them, that the Holy Spirit will minister to each of our hearts. And Lord Jesus, I need this message for my heart. Deal gently with me and deal patiently with me. And Lord, thou knowest all things and you know that I love you. Deal with the reluctance in my heart to walk in the truth as it's made known to me. Take away the, the timid nature that comes from the flesh, that dares not always to walk in the boldness that there is in faith and in thy word. Take each of us this morning and just fold us in your arms like a shepherd would take his sheep and whatever we have need of, graciously supply it. Because thou art El Shaddai, 
the breasted one, the nourisher, the strength giver, the sufficient one. Now our God, there is none like him, none beside him. Blessed Holy Spirit, have thy way with each of us, and especially with this messenger boy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to read from a passage of Scripture in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 8. I'm not even going to give you one apologetic statement for reading such a long passage. It simply is the Word of God. Beginning at verse 12, these words followed the incident, the story of how Jesus came from the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came into the temple. People gathered around, and he began to teach them. And while he was teaching them, the scribes and Pharisees came, brought a woman taken in adultery. You remember the story of how he dealt with her in grace, how he brought conviction upon her accusers, how he ended up by saying that neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And then spake Jesus again unto them, and the them of this verse are the Pharisees and the scribes and the people who had come to hear him. He turned to them and he said, I am the light. If you'll pardon my changing these words just a little bit, I think you, if you just trust me until you can get home and check me, you'll find that I'm not doing any violence to it. I am the light of mankind, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, You bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Yes. Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. And you can't tell where I came from, and you don't know where I'm going. You're only judging after the flesh. I judge no man. Yet if I did decide to judge someone, my judgment would be true, because I'm not alone. I and my Father that sent me. Now, it's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true, and I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. And then said they unto him, Well, where is your Father? Jesus said, You don't know me, and you don't know my Father. Because if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I am going my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sin. Singular. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Is he going to commit suicide? He just got through saying, Where I am going, you can't come. Then he said unto them, You are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world's system, but I am not of this world's system. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sin. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sin. Then said they unto him, Who are you? Jesus said unto them, I am just the same as I told you from the very beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world or to mankind those things which I have heard of him. But they didn't understand that he spoke to them of the Father. And then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am. And I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. I always do those things that please him. And as he spake these words... Listen carefully to the results of his preaching. Many believed on him. Not a few, many. Many believed on him. And then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever habitually commits sin is the slave of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free in reality. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I was thinking last night, I don't know whether I ever did think before, but I did at least last night, whether the Lord Jesus ever experienced any frustration when he was here upon the earth. And uh, I've been trying to decide since yesterday whether he ever did experience true frustration. Frustration is to be perplexed and have no place to turn, no way to turn, and no way out. Just have pieces that you can't put together. And uh, I don't think he experienced any frustration because he perfectly understood what he was dealing with. And I don't understand what I'm dealing with. But if his knowledge were limited as mine is, and if he didn't know what was in all men, like I don't know what is in all men, it must have been frustrating to him to be the light of the world and live in a world that was saturated in darkness while at the same time saying they could see. And I get little boy illustrations and I thought, how would you like to take a busload of blind children to Disneyland? You talk about an exercise in frustration? But how would you like to take a busload of blind children to Disneyland and have all of them say that they could see when it was obvious to you that they couldn't see anything? What a frustration to live in a world of lies and know the truth. What a frustration to live in a world of hatred and know the love of Jesus. What a frustration to live in a world where the lie is God and the truth is turned into a lie. I don't know whether he experienced any of this frustration or not, but I do. And it's enough to tell you that had I been in his place on the temple steps, I don't know what I would have done. These Pharisees asked the same questions. And he gave them the same answers, day after weary day. They brought the same hard propositions, and he gave them the same simple solutions. They brought their rigid theology, and he gave them the simple truth. He gave them every evidence, every proof, every privilege to know and to see and to understand in their hearts that he was the God they said they worshipped and that the Abraham they claimed as their father would have bowed at his feet and worshipped and adored him had he been there among them. So I don't know, as I said, whether he experienced any frustration, but I do. It's a terrible hard job to preach the gospel in a Christian land where everybody's sure they know the gospel, where everybody's heard the gospel, and when so very, very few have ever seen it in the revelation of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. It's difficult to keep saying the same things over and over and over and over again and feel the frustration of people hearing and not hearing, seeing and not seeing, saying they understand but not comprehending, mouthing the words, going through the motions, assenting to the doctrine but never even a trace of the reality of this freedom and this liberty that Jesus said was the absolute evidence of true faith in the truth as he gave it. Now, it's necessary for just a few moments, and my subject is the truth, to talk to you a little bit about the background of some of his statements here because unless you were an instructed Jew, some of them would go by you and you wouldn't catch them. He uses a Hebraistic phrase continually as he talks with these Pharisees. He refers to himself as I am. 
The English translators have added the pronoun he, I am he, because they thought that made it intelligible, but it doesn't make it intelligible at all. What he was saying to them is that ye shall seek me and ye shall die in your sin. Whither I go ye cannot come. Ye shall die in your sin, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. And this Hebrew phrase goes clear back to almost the beginning of the Old Testament, to the third chapter of Exodus. When Moses turned aside out of the beaten path, and he, draw, he drew himself near to the burning bush, a bush that was aflame, and yet it was not consumed, a sight so wonderful and so marvelous that he could not continue in his plan course, but he deviated and he broke with all of the society around him and said, a thing this big I've got to see, I've got to understand, because someone says that God is up there in this mountain and I'll go and see. And so he went, <clears throat> and out of the midst of this flaming shrub, <clears throat> he heard the word of God. Now the first chapter of John tells me that the word of God is and was and always has been the eternal living word, the Lord Jesus. And when Moses turned aside, it was Jesus that he heard and Jesus that he saw in the midst of that flaming bush. He fell down on his face and he removed his shoes and he said, I'm on holy ground. I'm holy ground. Holy ground. And out of the midst of that bush came the voice, the word of God. And among the things that was said to Moses, this statement was made. Moses said, yes, if I go down and tell the people that you sent me, they will say, what is his name and what will I say? And he said, tell them this, tell them, I am that I am hath sent thee. And you see, that's, that's not even grammatically correct. It's a blank check. It's an unfinished sentence. <clears throat> it's a statement that doesn't have any meaning. I am. I am. You are what? But he doesn't answer. He just says, I am. I am. And that to me has to be the great question of the Old Testament. Who is he? He's revealed himself after a fashion. He's made himself known to men in a way. He led the children of Israel. He performed his miracles and he works. He gave his word, presented his law, set up the tabernacle service, ordained the priesthood, anointed kings and sent prophets. No man had ever seen him. No man had ever known him. No man had ever stood in his presence and lived. You close the Old Testament with one question, who is he? Who is he? And he only answers, I am. But when you come to the New Testament, the answer is there. But the answer is a person. The answer is Jesus. And so wherever he went, he was making statements like, I am the light. I am the resurrection. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the bread. I am the shepherd. I am the door. I am all that man needs. I am all that man will ever need. I am all man has ever dreamed of, desired, longed for, hoped for, prayed for. I am. I am everything every man needs. And that's why I came into the human race to fully declare who I am. To make known once and forever who I am. And one of the great I am statements of the New Testament is found in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He was the truth by which God the Father sanctified all those of us who have believed in him. And he was the truth that fully declared and gave a perfect expression of the unknown and the invisible 
God and what it means to be lost, what it means to die in your sin, what it means to perish for eternity is simply this, the refusal to believe the revelation God has given of himself in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And John writes it in his epistle that if you don't believe the record God has given of his Son, you have no life. And you've called God a liar. And this is the record God has given of his Son. This is the witness that he has given to us eternal life given it to us. And this life is in His Son. Oh, it's such a simple message, isn't it? This isn't hard to grasp if your heart wants to hear it. What it means to be lost to the Jew when Jesus preached to him on the temple steps was one thing. What it means to be lost to us Gentiles who are not on the temple steps listening to Jesus preach, but bless your hearts, we are listening to the Lord Jesus Christ preach to every man who knows and loves the gospel of grace as he announces and proclaims the record God has given of his Son. To the Jew it meant this, if you don't believe that I am, if you don't believe that the Jehovah God of the Old Testament and I are one and the same, if you don't believe that if you've seen me you've seen the Father. If you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, if you don't believe that I am the eternal God manifest in the flesh, you'll surely die in your sins. Because that was the gospel of the kingdom, was to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But the gospel for today is another gospel altogether. It doesn't deal with the Messiah of the Old Testament. It deals with the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Son of God in the New Testament. The eternal God himself made manifest in the flesh to die for sinners like me, to be a substitute, to be a sacrifice and an offering that would satisfy the eternal Godhood forever and ever in regards to my sin and my lack of righteousness and would declare me just, perfect, holy, blameless and acceptable in his sight forever and ever. But just as the gospel that Jesus preached from the temple steps had its response from the Jew, the gospel that's preached today from within the temple of the living God has its same results. And what were the results of this preaching? The results are simply this. <clears throat> Many believed. <clears throat> That seems to run head on into conflict with what I have believed for a long time, and that is that when the truth is preached, there's not going to be very many people believe. Now, Scriptures teach this, doesn't it? Beware when all men speak well of you. You're in trouble when the crowds believe you. I told a preacher this not long ago. If you're preaching the truth and you're not making anybody mad, you're not saying anything. If you're not dividing the people you preach to, your message isn't coming through. If you're not causing some to hate you and some to love you, you're not enunciating clearly the message the Holy Spirit has to give. The message hasn't changed since the day Paul spoke of the offense of the gospel. And men haven't changed since the day Paul preached that gospel to them. Nothing has changed except the message today. And that's the reason the gospel today, as it's preached, has no offense and it has no power. But brethren, let me tell you, this statement is not in contradiction with the truth. Jesus preached the truth. He told them plainly. He gave the record God had given of his Son. He set the gospel of his time before them. And he said, Here I am. And if you don't believe, you'll surely die in your sins. And many believed on him. 
how could many believe on him if this was really the truth when Jesus himself had said that the many will take the broad way and only the few will find the straight and narrow that leads to life? How can this be so that many believed on him when he said that many were called but few were chosen? <clears throat> well, it's because that it is possible to believe the gospel that is preached to you without it having any saving effect upon you at all. And I nicknamed this kind of faith a while back. I, I call it kind of a halfway faith. And people who have it, I classify as Christian infidels. It is a, it is a heart that says, Lord, I believe, but is constantly overruled by a head that says, Help thou my unbelief. It's a profession that says with his lips, I believe. But every act and every deed and every reaction of the life says, I do not really believe at all. And what I say I believe is not really true at all. You follow me? Okay. Now I want to show you a little bit about this. In the second chapter of John, you fellows may be here a while because I've been gone for a week, you know. In chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, after the marriage feast of Cana, he had gone into the temple and he had scourged the people and driven them out with his whip, overthrown the table of the money changers. It says at verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast, many believed in his name when they saw. How does faith come, my dear people? By the hearing of the word of God, not by the seeing of miracles. These people believe with a faith based on what they saw, what they can understand, what they could rationalize, what they could cope with in the mind. And so on the basis of what they saw, many of these people believe, but Jesus, listen to what the Greeks said, <laughs> did not trust himself unto them. Jesus did not believe in them because he knew all men and he didn't need that anybody should testify of man. He knew what was in man. And I don't know how far I'll get in this message on the truth, but I'm going to give you this while I'm, I've got it. <clears throat> you can't fool Jesus. You can fool everybody else, but you can't fool him. You can say all the prayers you want to. You can say all the words you want to. You can pray, Lord Jesus, come into my heart a thousand times and never mention the hundred reservations that you tack on that down deep in the hidden place in your heart. Like, you can come into my heart if you don't change anything. You can come into my life if you don't hurt anything. You can come into my life if you don't rock the boat. You can come into my life if you don't change what I don't want changed or make me what I don't want to be. You can come into my life if things will be just like I want them to be from now on. You can say all the prayers you want to. You can cry and you can plead and you can weep and you can repent and you can pray. But I'll tell you one thing, you can't fool my Savior. You can't fool Him. You can stand up and testify and say, I believe. You can have other men come and testify and He will say, I don't need that man should testify about what's in your heart. I know what's in your heart. I've never trusted myself to you because you've never trusted yourself to me. I praise the Lord for that. Let me use some modern words that I understand. Nobody ever cons Jesus. I've been conned so many times. I've been ripped off so many times by the flowery speeches of human beings around me. I've been lied to and deceived by friend and foe alike. I've had brethren come, false brethren so-called, as Paul named them in his epistle, and put their arms around me and said, I love you, brother. I need your fellowship, brother. Walk out of my presence. Get their 30 pieces of silver and betray me with a kiss the next time they meet me in public. But I want to tell you something. Nobody has ever fooled Jesus and nobody ever will. You've got your work cut out for you if you think flowery speeches in the presence of men will get the job done. 
You got your work cut out for you if you think going to your bedroom alone at night and crying and weeping great crocodile tears of repentance and saying all the speeches will change things with Jesus. I promise you this this morning on the authority of this book, and he and this book are one and the same, I promise you this, he will never, never, never trust himself to you until you have trusted yourself to him. He will never be real to you until you are willing to be real with him. Never. That's why Jesus isn't real to some of you. You've got a halfway faith. You believe the words. You believe the preaching. Why you bite your tongue off before you said it wasn't true? But Jesus isn't real to you, and you know that. He's doing something to you. I'll tell you in a little bit what it will eventually do to you. In the 12th chapter of John, <clears throat> in this same book, notice in verse 42 where you run head on into this halfway faith again. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Many again, you see, is associated with those who believe. Many. Many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, <clears throat> lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me believes not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I have come a light unto mankind, and whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. Listen to me, brethren. Men who have really believed have seen the one who sent him. Men who have really believed are not walking in darkness, nor abiding in darkness, but they have light for life. Life isn't a dark tunnel anymore to them. They have light, and they know where they came from, and they know where they're going. And if you believe not, you will die in your sin, and you will never find out where I came from, and you will never find out where I'm going. This is what Jesus didn't need any man to tell him. He knew what was inside of him. Now, I'll tell you what was inside of them. They had believed, oh, yes, many professed him and said, I believe, Lord, I believe, Lord. I believed that down deep inside they had a fear. And the fear was that if I say this openly, if I walk in it too boldly, if I dare to take him at his word and step out, They'll put me out of the synagogue. And then men will not praise me. And I really do want the praise of men more than the praise of God because I have to live down here in this old sinly world, as a fellow told me one time, with men around me. And I want their praise. And I want their acceptance. And I want their approval of where I am and how I walk. And I want access into their synagogue. And I want their fellowship. And I want their friendship. And Jesus just says, yes, I know that. You want it more than you want mine. And because you've never trusted yourself to me, I'll never trust myself to you. And this is what he says at the judgment. Depart from me, ye who say, Lord, Lord. Ye who have done many wonderful works. Ye who have cast out demons. Ye who have called me Lord all your life. Go away from me. I never knew you. You said you knew me, but I never knew you. And the word that he uses there in that judgment passage, K-N-E-W, is a word which is used throughout the Bible, the New Testament at least, in connection with knowing a woman in an intimate way, the marriage relationship. So he said, I never knew you. You said you were my bride, but our marriage was never consummated. You said I was your husband and you called me Lord. The only Lord you ever had, the only husband you ever knew, 
was your wonderful works. Now go away from me and leave me alone. Because me trusting myself to you depends upon you trusting yourself to me. And you never, never did. Well, what does this message say to us already? It says this, that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Is that true? It says that a man can say he believes and verily think that he believes and not believe at all in saving sense. So there must be more to faith than just saying I believe and there must be more to faith than just making a public profession because these people came out and made a public profession. If they hadn't made a public statement of some kind, if they hadn't in some way indicated in the presence of Jesus, the record wouldn't show that many believed. A multitude of them said, we believe, we believe, we believe, we believe. And here in this passage in John 8, that's what happened after he preached on the temple steps. These very people who just got through called him a liar. These very people who said, give us proof and evidence. We don't know who you are. These very people to whom he had just said, you will seek me one of these days. Oh, there will come a time when you realize that you are in bondage and you will need the liberty I now promise you. And you'll look for me and you'll search for me diligently, but you will never find me. Liberty comes when I bring it to you, not when you come after me for it. And to these very people, to whom he had just witnessed in their presence the very power of God in not only lifting the condemnation of the law of God by his sovereign right in forgiving the dear woman who was taken in adultery. This man who had demonstrated the power of the Holy Ghost in convicting the conscience and the hearts of those who surrounded her until they could not stand in his presence but stole out one at a time. This man who said, I am the truth. You'll face me now, or you'll face me later, but you'll face me. And when you commit yourself to me, the truth, I'll commit myself, the truth, to you. And when I do, <laughs> it will set you free, and the freedom will be a reality. Well, how do I know, not you, how do I know that I have believed with my heart or with my head? How do I know that I don't just have a halfway faith? How can I be sure that I just haven't made a profession of the Lord Jesus Christ, having heard all of the right words and the correct doctrine, and finally said, yes, I believe? How can I be sure that that's the kind of faith that will save my soul? Well, that's a question that no believer would ever ask. Because the man who has believed with his heart unto righteousness knows the freedom that the truth brings and he knows the reality of that liberty. And do you know how I know that he knows it? He walks in it. You say, well, what's this supposed to mean? Well, that's what I'm here for. Heck, that's my job. So I get paid for. If there weren't any questions, I'd be unemployed. Look at verse 30. As he spake those words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Notice the ones he addresses. To those Jews which believed on him. These Jews that had just said we believe. He said if. <laughs> There's an if here. If. This is not the if that says since it is so. Like it says, if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That word means since you have believed on Christ, seek those things which are above. But this is a conditional word. This is a little condition, hinging. The whole thing hinges, he said, on this little if. 
You say you believe, many of you, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'll have to watch you walk, Jesus said. Not that he didn't know in advance, he did, but I have to watch you walk. I'll have to see whether the way you walk is a carbon copy of the way you believe or not. Because a man walks just exactly the way he believes. Just exactly. Because if you know the truth, it will set you free. And that's something you can't fight because the man who's been set free by real faith in the truth is a man who has also known the reality of bondage. And so what we have here, friends, is this. Many believe, but they do not continue. The word means to abide. They don't continue in the word they say they believe. They don't abide in the word they say they believe. They don't walk in the truth they say they know. The truth is up here in the head, but the walk, which is motivated by the heart, seems to be untouched by it. They have a fear that keeps them from walking in the truth they profess. And the big fear is that they may discover in trying to walk in it that what they have said for so many years is true may not be true at all. So they love their darkness and their deception and their delusion better than they like the test of reality. You hearing me? Okay. When Jesus says in verse 36, "...the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free," the Greek says in reality... I want to know what that sin, what that freedom meant. And here's what the Greek word means. It means that if you believe with a hard faith, you will continue in what you believe. You'll abide in it. You'll walk in it. You can't help it. And walking in the truth you believe will set you free. It'll set you free from every bond, every prison cell. Every chain and every fetter, just keep walking. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me drop this in. The word know is a choice here by the Holy Spirit of a special word. It doesn't mean an absolute once and for all knowledge that never increases and never decreases. It means a progressive experience of knowledge. You with me? Those who have really believed will experience a progressive revelation of truth in which they will abide, and as truth is progressively revealed to them, and as they progressively abide in it, because they can do no less, it's a reality to them, you see, they are progressively liberated and progressively set free. Oh, I love this. It's one thing to be saved, and now he uses this word disciple, and the word disciple means learner. If you've really believed in your heart on me, you will also learn of me. Remember what he said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight and 29? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That applies to us today. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. That's the freedom I'm talking about. That's the liberty I'm talking about. And how do you learn it? You learn it by listening to the heart of Jesus. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You come listen to my heart. And if you've really believed with a heart faith, brethren, you'll keep on hearing the heart of Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. They don't always like where they're going. They don't always like what they experience as they go. They don't always like the obvious destination to which they're being led. They don't like the results of it around them. But they love the truth. And they abide in it. 
And as they abide in it, and as they walk in it, the progressive revelation of truth given to us by the Holy Spirit of whom Jesus said, He shall bring all things to remembrance. He shall lead you into all truth. Jesus is that truth, and day by day there should be in our experiences a progressive learning of the truth that Jesus is. Learning that truth, we abide in it because it's a reality. And abiding in it as a reality, we are day by day experiencing new liberations and at the same time discovering new bondage from which we expect to be delivered. Here's what the word means when Jesus says you should be free indeed, you should be free in reality. Listen. Oh, I love these words. <laughs> Unrestrained. Isn't that a wonderful word? Unrestrained. To go at pleasure. The contrast is drawn between a citizen and a slave. A slave is a man that's chained. He has to go whenever he's told to go, and he has to do whenever he's told to do. And he has to be whenever he's told to be. And when his master says die, he has to die because a slave don't have any choice. He's in bondage. But let me tell you something. When the truth comes and sets him free, he's unrestrained. He can go at pleasure. He's no longer a slave. He's a citizen. He has rights that were purchased for him by the one who freed him from the slave market. Another meaning of this word free is to be exempt. Listen to this. <laughs> exempt of duty. Do you servicemen know what ROD is? It means to be relie relieved permanently from all duty. That's what this word means. It means to be relieved of all obligation. It means to be set at liberty. Brother, I need a little laugh. You need any laugh? It'd do you good and help you too. It can only come this way. By believing the truth, that's Jesus, abiding in Jesus as he reveals himself to you. Not as he reveals himself to me, but as he reveals himself to you. Abide, continue, walk in the reality of that truth as you see and know him. And brother... He'll walk you right out of every cell you're in, and he'll snap every chain and every bond and every fetter. He'll set you free, and free indeed, free in reality, you'll be unrestrained. And with great pleasure and at your pleasure, you will go and come as a citizen ought to, free of all duty and free of all obligation, truly a man, a woman, who knows liberty. And it seems apropos at this point to say, like that great American patriot, this is not a political speech, give me liberty or give me death. Give me liberty or give me death. Well, I've been praying all morning, and I'm praying now that the Lord will deal tenderly with me, that he will deal patiently with me, because this message is for me. And he's been gently and tenderly and patiently saying to me, <clears throat> when you preach on this, be sure and search your own heart. Make sure that there is some reality in the freedom you preach. Make sure it's not just words. Make sure it's not just doctrine. Make sure that you can look within and look back. For that's the only insight and backside I have. 
And can you see any reality in your own heart? Can you see it in your life? I said, yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I can. I can. It's not an imagined reality, it's real. And I'll tell you just a little bit about what's happened in my heart and life down through the years. And First of all, this may seem like a doctrinal part to you, but it's real to me. I have been relieved and exempted from duty and obligation. I've been set at liberty from a bondage I was in for a long time, a bondage that had to do with my sin and sins. I don't know what people understand when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because the word gospel means good news. And I know that when the Holy Spirit opened my heart to receive this message and to believe this record and to face this truth about myself and about Him, it was the best news I'd ever heard in all my life. I've been preaching it for more than a quarter of a century, and it never fails to excite me and thrill me. It's true, and it's real, and it brought me out of bondage. What bondage? First of all, the bondage I had suffered for so long, the guilt, the condemnation, the wrath of God that was upon my soul, and I knew it from the day one in my life. I had gone about trying to establish my own righteousness. I'd gone about working and taking upon every man's obligation and duty of religion that I found. Sacrifices over and over and over, multitude of tears, promises and statements and professions, efforts and endeavors. But the same guilt, the same nagging condemnation, the same burden of God's wrath resting upon my hell-deserving soul was always there until I believed. And brother, I want to go on record this morning and tell you that when I believed the record God gave of His Son, that Jesus, my precious Savior, bear in His own body on the tree at Calvary all of my sins, past, present, and future. When I believed God's record that at the cross of Calvary He not only buried my sins in the body of His Son, but he also sheathed the sword of his wrath in his soul and took sin and sins to hell and covered them up with the outer darkness where the light of God will never penetrate again and where no man will ever resurrect him. where every claim was silenced and every charge brought to nothing. When I believed God and took him at his word and stepped out with trembling faith and said, Lord, I'm going to walk in the reality of that. And if I perish, I perish. But if I go down, I will go down trusting you. And I want to tell you when I did that, I got freed. I got liberated. I don't worry about my sins. I don't have any conscience of sins. You say, that's horrible. Well, read the 10th chapter of Hebrews. That's precisely what Paul says will be the result of any man who rests in the perfect sacrifice of God's Son. Amen? Amen. In the Christian world I live in, Christian, quote-unquote, a man is damned and branded as a heretic for walking in that. Accused of having spiritual arrogancy. Accused of having pharisaical pride. Do you know why that's so? Because those people who make those condemnations and those accusations are people who are only testifying to the reality of the gospel they believe, and that is that a man is saved by works and kept by works. It's a mystery of iniquity. 
you can. I said, to, you know, I was down at uh, Charleston here last week, and I was telling some friends last night, I said, you know, I sat down in that meeting, and I said, I made that dumb, stupid, ridiculous statement that I didn't have any conscience of sin and sins, and that the Holy Spirit never convicted me of sin and sins, and that it just didn't trouble me at all, and, and nobody could bother me at all in my conscience about sin and sins. And I said, you know, when I saw the look on that person's face sitting next to me, when I said that, I felt like, I won't tell you what I told them I felt like. I think I will. I told them I felt like a damn fool. Because as soon as I said that, my mind swarmed over me like a pack of yellow jackets. And it just said, you are out of your mind. You are crazy. You are sitting here saying something that the whole religious world will crucify you for. And do you know why they will? Because it's the truth. And you either believe it or you don't. And I want to tell you, when it comes to my sin and sins, I don't have any guilt of them. I don't feel condemned because of them. Oh, I see them and I'm aware of them. But they don't bother me. Why don't they bother you? Because God isn't bothered by them. And hey, if God ain't bothered by them, if they bother you, that's your problem. They don't bother me and they don't bother him. He don't talk about sin and sins to me and I don't talk to sin and sins about him. I don't recite my sins and failures to him because he nailed them all to Calvary in the body of his son. And he said, they're dead and there's nothing to talk about and I am satisfied forever and ever with the sacrifice my dear son has made. Do you know how I see you, my child? I see you perfect. I see you clothed in the righteousness of myself. And I see you seated here glorified as though you've been here for an eternity past. Hush! I will not talk about that vile thing which I have put into hell and buried. Why will you bring the bloody thing back that took the soul of my son from me? Silence. I'm not troubled by them, and you must not ever be troubled by them again. And if that ain't good news, it'll do till some comes along. And if that isn't the gospel of the truth of God, there isn't any gospel in this world, and I don't want to hear anything anybody's got to say along the line of religion. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I don't know. I'll never get everything said. The, some of the liberty that I see in my own heart is that. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. What liberty that is. <laughs> to not to have to lay down at night and recount all my sins before a holy God. And then tremble and go to sleep with the uncertainty as to whether or not He heard me and has forgiven me. I'm free of all that. Relieved and exempt from that duty and obligation which man had put on me so long. And I'm also free, brethren, from the fear that I won't be loved and accepted. I don't know what's the matter with me. You know, I mother should have saved her money and dad and sent me at the head shrinker when I was a little boy and got me straightened out. Because I grew up with some bent out of shape complexes down inside. And one of them I've had since I was a little boy. That's what made me such an extrovert. Was the fear of not being loved and the fear of not being accepted. People who know me have accused me of being a peopleholic and uh, they're right. I've needed people. I've needed to be constantly assured. Needed to be constantly secure in their friendship and their acceptance and their love. You follow me? You know about that? This concludes part one of CS60, Halfway Faith. For the conclusion of this message, please follow the link to CS60, part two, 
Halfway Faith Conclusion